Hi, I'm Steve. Uh, and um, early this month, or early last month, I made a game in Rust in seven days. And I'm going to talk about my experience doing this um, and plug my game and talk about what you might want to keep in mind when choosing Rust as your language for doing a game jam. Uh, so my game jam of choice is the seven-day roguelike. It's, uh, it's held every year in March. You make a roguelike game in seven days um, in whatever language or framework or engine you like. So first of all, we have to explain what a roguelike is, since it's a fairly niche genre video game. And there's actually a reasonable amount of like contention in the community about what a roguelike is and isn't. Uh, so the simplest way of explaining the genre is it's any game resembling the 1980 video game Rogue. Uh, Rogue was a terminal-only uh, adventure game made in the 80s, uh, made in 1980, in the spirit of Dungeons and Dragons. So, like D and D, you're delving into some dungeon in search of some mythical artifact, and you encounter various monsters and things on the way. Like D&D, it was turn-based. Every level was generated by an algorithm rather than something handcrafted. If you died, you had to restart from the start in a totally new procedurally generated, uh, procedurally generated dungeon. Because it was played in a terminal, levels were all on a square grid, and all the graphics was just ASCII or maybe ANSI, um, but it's all, it's all character-based graphics. There's no, there's no hand-drawn sprites or anything like that. And typically, you would have a character which levels up and gets stronger as you go, kind of like D&D. Now, all of, these, uh, all of these features are optional to varying degrees. There's various different definitions, like strict definitions of roguelike. People, you'll hear people talking about roguelite, which some, means some of these are left out. But uh, this, this game jam is fairly lax in its definition. So any game that kind of resembles Rogue qualifies. You have seven days. Go nuts. Here are some uh, screenshots from different entries into this year's seven day roguelike. Mine's here at the bottom, not the bottom left. But uh, yeah, so you can see they all kind of resemble this grid base. Some of them are ASCII. Some of them have got hand-drawn graphics. Uh, there's about 200 entries this year. It's great. There's, there's, there's a lot of really good, like high quality games uh, every year there's a whole bunch. It's, it's a really cool game jam. Uh, so mine is a game called Boat Journey. It's a game about a boat going on a boat and traveling through along a river to go to the ocean. And on the way, you have to gather resources and fight monsters and things. And uh, what more can I say about this? This is my, this is my eighth game jam, uh, my eighth um, seven-day roguelike game jam, the seventh one that I've done in Rust. And uh, yeah, um, I've sort of built up a collection of libraries along the way to deal with a lot of the low-level problems like uh, rendering and visible error detection and input parsing and stuff like that so I can focus all my time during the week on the actual game content itself. So why use Rust for game jams? It's notoriously slow to compile your code and this means that in a game jam where you're going to be doing a lot of iteration and playtesting and quickly tweaking things and trying to make your game actually fun, it can kind of get in the way. And this is the, the one reason why uh, you might choose not to use Rust. Uh, just the slow compile times can become a bit of a problem. I'm going to talk a bit later about the w a way that I mitigate this to an extent, but it's still, it's always going to be an issue. There's, Plenty of pluses, though. The uh, biggest one, I think, is that it kind of saves you from yourself. The type system and the burrow checker mean that you have to keep a handle on technical debt. You can't just go wild on the first day and build a whole bunch of complicated stuff without being careful about how it's designed. And this means that on the seventh day of your game jam, you're not cursing your seven days ago self for making a whole bunch of terrible decisions that you now have to live with. So it it does slow down the rate at which you can, you can develop, but it, I think this is actually a feature, not a bug. I think this means that by the end of the, of the week, you have something still reasonably easy to iterate on, and you're not just drowning in technical debt. The fast executable is obviously a plus to making games. You don't have to worry too much about um, data structures, like, or at least you get a benefit from the run. Yeah, and additionally, 
the Rust game dev community is actually quite rich. There's a lot of people who are making games in Rust, and so there's plenty of libraries uh, and support for building games in Rust. Uh, one such library is, is my library, Chagrid, which makes it super easy to build cross-platform games, or uh, text-based programs, I should say, in Rust. This is what I use for this game, and it's the reason why it was so easy to get it to run in a browser and also a window and also a terminal. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to chat about um, two specific uh, innovations relating to Rust and to this game that I thought were interesting and relevant to making games in Rust or making games in Rust in a hurry. The first one is Chagrid. So this is what I was talking about earlier. The game, as you can see, runs in a graphical window with Vulkan or Metal OpenGL, uh, a web browser with WebAssembly, and a terminal just by sending escape and see escape sequences to move the cursor and change the colors and stuff. And this is, this is, this is done through a library called Chagrid. Uh, I've spoken about Chagrid in a previous talk. I won't go into too much detail, but I'll just say that it's a library that abstracts away the rendering of grids of characters and also the handling of input. So you write most of your code in this generic way that just treats the rendering as a grid of characters with uh, foreground, background, colors, boldness, and underlines. And then there's different front ends for running it in various contexts. So there's a web context, a graphical context with, um, with WGPU, and a terminal context. And there's a couple of different graphical contexts. You can use WGPU, that's probably the fastest one. But there are some alternatives that we're going to see in a sec for um, uh, certain other use cases. Uh, so this is, this is showing the basic architecture of a Chagrid app. So there's different front ends. So when you compile this game, you get a couple of different executables for running it in a terminal and for running it in a graphical window, and also the WebAssembly files that you put into a web page for the browser-based version. And they all share the same library crate, which is the game's logic and generic rendering and input handling code. A problem that I ran into during development, though, is that it took quite a long time to compile. Uh, on my Linux machine that I was doing most of the work on, it took six seconds to build the graphical version. Mostly I was building the graphical version during my iteration because it, you can run it natively, which means you get a nice, uh, you can debug print without having to open up a browser console and it's generally pretty easy to just try and fail at stuff. And I was using Linux because that's what I have. But it was taking six seconds to build. And most of this time was spent compiling WGPU, which has hundreds of dependencies. Uh, and I put up with this for the duration of the jam because I didn't have time to do a lot of complicated uh, low-level like modifications to Chagrid itself. But after the jam, I was like, hey, how much better can I make this? How, how fast, how can I speed up compile times so that for the next jam, I don't have to wait quite so long between builds? And I had this idea of trying out SDL2, uh, which is uh, a, it's not really a game engine, but it's another, abstraction of input and rendering that's pretty popular among game developers. And it has the advantage of being a shared library that you install with your system package manager, and then there's like a thin layer of Rust bindings to it. So it has very few dependencies, and therefore it should be faster to compile. And sure enough, this got the build times, uh, the uh, debugging build times down from six seconds to two and a half which is pretty cool. It's uh, not really suitable for distributing as the actual runtime, like the actual version of the game that I release, just because it requires this external dependency that I have either have to ship with the game or ask people to install via the package manager, and I'd rather not do that if there's an alternative. And WGPU is fine for this use case. Uh, and also, I didn't spend a lot of time making it pretty, so text anti-aliasing is broken, and I don't care. It's, it's really just there as a front end for using while iterating on a game during a jam. And because Chagrid abstracts away the rendering and input handling the same for all the different front ends, I can just switch to using WGPU at the last minute when I go to release the game. Uh, all right, the second thing that I want to talk about is what I call ad hoc state machines with linear witnesses. So this is to solve the problem where you've got a there's multiple different kinds of modes that the game can be in during which input is handled differently. If you're just walking around or on the boat, you want the arrow keys to move the character around. But if you have a menu open, like if you're in the shop, say, and you're buying stuff, you need to 
interpret the arrow keys differently now. They, they're moving control through a menu. And there's a couple of other different sort of mo like UI modes that the game can be in. But I have this single like opaque uh, like game struct that represents the entire state of the game. And uh, this is distinct from the UI state, and I try to keep these two things isolated. But it means that uh, it means that depending on what state the game is in, what kind of input it's expecting, there might be certain methods that the game struct uh, exposes that don't make any sense to call. If I'm in a menu, what does it mean if I call move player? Like, you could imagine moving in the background, or you could imagine panicking and just requiring the user to keep track of you know, what's allowed in the current state, but this seems a bit messy, and I would rather have a nice, static, safe way of reasoning about what sort of actions I'm allowed to take at any point in time. One way of solving this would be to just wrap the entire game state up in an enum that makes explicit this state machine, but that's a bit of a pain. Uh, and I would rather be able to keep my game state just as a simple struct of fields representing different parts of the game and have some other way of switching between what's allowed and what's not. So I came up with this idea. I, I'm going to just make these four methods um, you know, as a simplification of, of what interface the game exposes. So if you move the plane in direction, you can use an ability indexed by an integer. Uh, you can be in the shop menu and commit a choice, where choice, that's to say that's an index into the list of items the shop is selling, and you can commit a blink, which uh, one, of these, one of these screenshots was, it's really hard to tell from these pictures, but uh, there's like an aiming mode where you use the arrow keys to aim a cursor, and then you hit enter. It blinks the character that was true. So there's three different states, right? There's normal gameplay state, which the first two methods are valid for. Uh, there's the shop state, where you can commit a shop menu choice. And there's the, uh, the aiming state, where you can commit a blink. And so here's the idea that I came up with that I call uh, linear witnesses. So we're relying on move semantics in Rust to make it so that at any point, there's this single value which we'll call a witness. And it can be of one of these three types, playing, shop menu, or aiming blink. Oops, excuse me. And the fact that one of these uh, types has been instantiated is going to be sufficient for of uh, proving to the game state that we're in a particular state. Importantly, this, these three types do not implement clone or copy. There's no way to make a new one out of thin air. You get given one when the game starts, and every time you make a call to the game's public API, at least the methods that mutate the game state, you have to pass, by move semantics, the current linear witness. And you'll see that the interface to the game now has been extended to accept the appropriate witness for the state that the game has to be in for that method to be called. So now there's no way to call commit blink while you're in the normal game state, the, the playing game state, because there's no way to make that type signature satisfied because you don't have a value of any blink. And the only way to get one is to commit an action which returns as any witness, which is just a key number of all the witnesses, which will happen to be the aiming blink um, variant when the action you did was the one that requires you to aim and then blink. So this is pretty easy to tack onto an existing game. I did this in between two jams when I had some time to think about how, how I might change this to make it a bit safer. And it was, it was a simple wrapper over the existing game stage, just added, just added checking witnesses and it means that there's, it's harder to get into situations where it's, you're calling the wrong game state, or the, the wrong method from the wrong game state. And that pretty much wraps up this talk. So the game is available to download and play at this link, and you can check out the source code. And I also maintained a, a journal every day. I would write what I did and show some screenshots of the in-progress uh, yeah, Game Jam game. I also streamed the first half of the Game Jam on Twitch, and all the videos are on YouTube, but I, I only made it halfway through, and then I got too burnt out to, to keep streaming. So, um, But yeah, it was, that was an interesting experience as well. So yeah, this is my game. Are there any questions? Yes? Did you make that image like, by hand? <laughs> oh, no. I, I made it by hand. I, I, um, I spent a couple of the, sorry, the question is, did I make this image by hand or did I rasterize a picture of a, of a boat? 
And I spent a week or two before the game, a month or two before the game, Java, to be honest, making a program, also in Rust, called Text Paint, which also uses Chargrid. You can run it in a terminal, and it lets you paint with text. So you can use the mouse to draw pictures. You can flood fill. You can, what can, what else can you, you can draw straight lines um, and like change the color and the, and the, the character of the cursor. Um, so I use that for all the graphics. Like there's another picture earlier that was um, the guy in the shop. Yeah, um, just, yeah, it was, this, is, this is the first game that I've made that has like hand-drawn ASCII graphics. And yeah, it's yeah. fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's another tool available. Um, called uh, Rex Paint, which the developer of um, this big roguelike called um, Cogmind makes. And it's just a much more sophisticated. It's more like Photoshop. My thing's more like MS Paint. Um, so yeah, I would check it out if you want to make ASCII graphics. Uh, yes? Yeah. Uh, did you consider making Chargrid itself a dynamic library, like what Bevy does? Ah, so the question is, should I consider making Chargrid itself a dynamic library? Um, like Bevy, I didn't realize Bevy did that, um, but that would make sense. If I get for Bevy, it's like a compiled kind of choose between making it dynamic or setting it dynamic mm. or iterating Yeah, cool. One complicating factor that um, I'd, I'd be curious to see how Bevy solved actually is that uh, the Chargrid API uses um, a whole bunch of like polymorphic functions, and I don't understand how you would make that a static, how you would maintain that in a static, uh, sorry, in a shared library. But yeah, I'll check out Bevy, because that would save a bunch of time, especially the, the front ends that have a whole bunch of dependencies like WGPU. Yeah. Uh, 